Hello, hello, hello. That took a while, didn't it? How is everyone doing? Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night. Goodbye. Or, I was going to say hello again, but yeah. You can all hear me, is that good? You over there in YouTube, you on TikTok, you on Twitch. Multi-stream, I'll tell you, it broke my heart. It completely broke my heart, but I think, I think we're there. And if we're not, I will, I will just have to keep going. Sorry for all the latency issues I think I got fixed. Basically, my camera settings were set up that you all were looking at me as though I was on a plasma screen. And let's just say social media can't handle this face on a big screen. But what we're going to do now for the next couple of days, well, when I say next couple of days, I mean hopefully three times over the next week, is go live reading as many Irish myths and legends leading up to St. Patrick's Day. Tomorrow I have the amazing opportunity, and I'm truly humbled by it, to attend the Lizzo concert here in Dublin. Warner Brothers Music um, here in Ireland have invited me as one of their guests, and yeah, that's going to be an experience. I, I don't know what to say to that. But maybe when I get back, I will read a story. Probably not, because I'll be traveling all over the place. So I'm hoping that the next evening I can read a story will be Thursday. But we'll see if I don't like hide in Lizzo's suitcase and just travel around the world with her. I have read a monster called Calls. What did you think of it, Ednix? I thought it was quite a heartbreaking story. And also, if you check out the movie, Shannon, hi. I'm just glad everyone there on Twitch can see as well. Are her concerts amazing, Michelle? I can't wait for it. I cannot wait for it. Do you remember how she had that very ancient crystal flute and she twerked and played with it? Well, in Ireland, we have the first ever um, Celtic harp in Trinity College Library. And here's the thing. That's only a couple of hundred meters away from the arena she's playing in. So like if someone wants to bring her a harp, the oldest harp in the world, and her to like twerk on stage singing like, am I ready or about damn time, I would lose my mind. It would be the best thing. Anyway, enough about Lizzo, so I think I'm going to start reading, if that's okay. I have a bunch of stories picked out, and I hope you don't mind. I'm going to read you probably one of my favorite ones now, because it's based in Claire. So, the first story we're going to read... Where are you? There we are. The King of Ireland's Son There was a king's son in Ireland long ago, and he went out in the snow with his gun and his dog. He slaughtered a raven, and the raven fell onto the snow. I will never eat two meals at one table or sleep two nights in one house until I find a woman whose hair is as black as this raven's wing, her skin as white, I think you know where I'm going with this, as white as the snow, and cheeks as red as the blood. There was only one woman like that. She was the fairest in the land, but she was the prisoner of the king of poison in the Western world. So the next day he set out. His money was scarce, but he took twenty pounds for his journey. He had not gone far before he came upon a funeral, and he said he would walk three steps alongside the coffin. He had not walked the three steps before a man stepped up and set down a bill on the coffin for an unpaid debt of five pounds. The dead man's son and daughter started weeping and wailing, because it was law in Ireland in those days that even the dead man must pay his debts 
before he could be buried. When the king's son heard of this, he reached into his pocket and paid the five pound debt. That left him with fifteen pounds. After that, he would walk as far as the church, and at the church gate another man set down a bill of five pounds. And the king's son said, I have already paid one five pounds. I can pay two. And he paid this second debt. So now he only had ten pounds. He went on his way, and he had not gone far before he met a short green man who asked him where was he going. And he said he was seeking a woman in the western world with hair as black as the raven, a skin as white as snow, and cheeks as red as blood. The short green man asked him, did he want a servant? Yes, said the king's son. But I don't have much money. What wages are you wanting? Oh, now the only wage I'd want, my sir, is to be the first to kiss your bride if you would win her, said the short green man. And the king's son agreed. But he said, well, you, you can have the first kiss, but only after I've kissed her. Fair enough, sir. They went on their way and had not gone far when they met another man. This man was pointing his gun in the far distance, but they could not say anything he was aiming at. What are you doing? said the king's son. I'm going to shoot the blackbird in the western world and have it for my supper, said the eye man. Well, you had better come along with us, said the short green man. It's not long before they met another man, and this one had his ear to the ground. What are you doing? said the king's son. I'm listening for the grass growing in the eastern world, said the ear man. Well, you had better come with us, said the short green man. And farther along they met another man, who was herding a field of hares. This man had one leg crossed over the other, with the foot slung over his shoulder. Why are you hopping like that? said the king's son. If I unhooked this leg, I would walk so fast that I would be out of sight, said the footman. You had better come with us, said the short green man. And a while later, this company of very odd fellows met another man turning a windmill by snorting out of one nostril. He kept snorting and snorting, his face getting redder and redder, and he closed one finger over the other nostril. And the king's son asked, Why do you have one finger on your nose? And the man said, So I can blow where to blow from this one nostril. If I would sweep up the windmill, if I use two, you see. Well, you had better come with us, said the green man. Then they met another man. The king's son was getting quite impatient with all these strange men as he was walking across Ireland, and he was breaking stones by the side of the road. He did not have a hammer. He was breaking the stones with his thighs. Why are you doing that, said the prince's son. I've got thick thighs. And I use my thighs to grind the stones to powder, said the thigh man. You had better come with us, said the short green man. So the king's son of Ireland had a short green man, had an eye man, an ear man, a foot man, a blow man, and a thigh man. And they all went together until the evening came and the end of day. They came to the house of a giant, and the short green man said, We shall stop here for the night. And he went up to the door and went a rat -a tat tat with his stick. The giant came to the door saying, I feel the smell of a melodious lion Irishman in the air. The short green man said, I am no melodious Irishman. I am come to tell you that my master is coming, and that if he finds you here, he will strike your head off. As he spoke, the short green man was growing bigger and bigger and bigger until he was nearly the size of the giant's house. Is, uh, is your master as big as you? said the giant fearfully. Oh, no, said the short green man, who is now the tall green man. He is much bigger. So the short green man put the giant under lock and key and went back to tell the king's son that the coast was clear. 
the son of the king of Ireland, and the short green man, and the eye man, the ear man, the foot man, the blow man, and the thigh man, spent their night in the giant's castle. One third of it telling fairy tales, one third of it telling tales of Fionn McCool, and the other third having sweet slumber. In the morning they left, and the short green man went to release the giant. But before he could unlock the door, he asked the giant to give him an old black cap from under his bed. I'll give you a brand new one that I have never worn. No, said the giant. I would be ashamed to give you this old black cap. But the short green man said, If you don't give me that cap now, boy, my master will strike you dead. In that case, I'll give it to you, said the giant. And the short green man undid the lock, and the giant gave him an old black cap that was under his bed. If you put that cap on your head, you can see everyone, but no one can see you. Sure don't I know that already, said the short green man to the giant. How do you know that, said the giant. Oh, said the short green man, I have my ways. The next night they spent in the giant's house, one third of the night telling fairy tales, another third telling tales of Fionn McCool again, and then the final third telling sweet slumber in their dreams. This time, when they left, the short green man went to the giant to find an old pair of slippers that he had under his bed, and the giant offered him a new pair of boots, but the old short green man said, No, I'll take those old slippers. If you put those slippers on, and say hi over. They will make you go anywhere you want, said the giant. The short green man said yet again, Sure don't I know that? And the giant asked yet again, How do you know that? But this time, the short green man only smiled and walked away. The next night they spent in the giant's house. The third they were telling fairy tales, a third they were telling Fionn McCool stories, and the final third they were telling tales in their own dreams of sweet slumber. And this time, the short green man went to the giant and asked for a rusty old sword from under his bed. I'll give you any other sword, said the giant. Don't take this one. But the short green man insisted, If you don't give me that rusty sword... My master will use it to cut your head off. You shall have the sword, said the giant. It will cut through anything, even iron. It cannot be stopped once it touches earth. And let me guess, you already knew that. And the short green man winked. So, the king and Barland's son, the short green man, the eye man, the ear man, foot man, blow man, and the thigh man, went forward again until evening came, and by the end of day they arrived in the eastern world, where lived a lady with hair as black as a raven, skin as white as snow, and cheeks as red as blood. The king's son and his companions got to the lodgings in the castle of the king of poison where the lady was, and the castle was all set around skulls on spikes. What do you want? said the lady. I want to marry you, said the king's son. If you want to marry me, you must free me from this enchantment, said the lady. But I must tell you, all those skulls you see around the castle, those have been men who have tried to set me free. If you fail, your skull will join theirs. I'm not afraid, said Ireland's king's son. So the lady gave him a pair of scissors. This is the first test. You must give those scissors back to me in the morning. That's not much of a test, said Ireland King's son. But in the night, the lady was placed in pin of slumber under his pillow. So that as soon as he went to bed and he fell asleep, she would come and take the scissors and gave them to the king of poison. If the short green man had not been keeping a watch, the king's son would have been lost. But the short green man put the old black cap on and the old slippers on his feet, took the rusty sword in hand and said hi over, and in a flash found himself in the room of the king of poison. He took the scissors back 
and gave them back to the king's son. In the morning, the lady said, Do you have my scissors? And the king's son replied, Yes, my lady, of course I do. So the next night she gave him a comb, and he must give that back to her in the morning. Again, she set a pin of slumber under his pillow, so that when the prince went to sleep, again he would fall under the enchantment. Again, she took the comb and gave it to the king of poison. And again, the little green man took the hat, the slippers, and the sword, and stole it back. In the morning, the king's son awoke to find the comb where it was. And then the short green man said, Sir, do you realize you're an awful Amadon? That means fool, idiot in Irish. And the prince's son, the king of Ireland's son, said, What? I have rescued this twice for you. I rescued the scissors and I rescued the comb. So you needn't worry. I am here for you. The king's son gave the lady the comb and she was full of wonder. Wondering, wondering, but slowly falling in love. On the third night, she gave the son of the king of Ireland one more thing. And she said, tomorrow morning, you must give me the head of the man who cuts his hair with this scissors and combs his hair with this comb. If you do not, you must lose your own head. That night, she gave the scissors and the comb to the king of poison he, and told him to guard them with his life. So the king of poison hid them inside a great stone and locked it behind three scour locks and sat beside it all night. The lady set the pin of slumber under the pillow again, and the king's son, yet again, fell fast asleep. The little green man took the cap, the slippers, and the sword, and said, Hi over! And in an instant, he was beside the great stone. He could see the king of poison, but the king of poison could not see him, for he was wearing the cap of invisibility. The short green man drew the rusty sword, at first, his stroke cut through the locks, his second stroke cut through the stone, and his third stroke cut through the king of poison's head. When the short green man returned, he woke the king's son and just threw the head, flop, onto the bed, along with the scissors and the comb. In the morning, the lady came and asked, Do you have the head? And the king's son said, I do. Uh, yeah, yes, right here. I have the head, I have the scissors, and I have the comb. And he threw them, quite relieved, to her. The lady gave a shriek of anger. I will never marry you, unless you can send a runner who will fetch three bottles of water of life from the well in the western world, and fetch them quicker than any runner I can send. If my runner comes back first, you will lose your head. The lady sent an old hag and gave her three empty bottles to fetch the water of the western world in. The short green man took three bottles, and gave them to the footman, who had been herding the field of hares. The footman and the hag set off together, and the footman unhooked his foot from across his shoulder, and as soon as he did, he was out of sight. He was in the well of the western world, filled his bottles, and was halfway back, before the hag was even halfway there. He greeted her, and she said, Sit down and rest a while. There you are. Already married. So there's no need to be breaking your heart running. Look at them, young love. So the footman, who could run faster than anyone in the world, settled down next to the old hag. But she put a spell of slumber over him. So he fell asleep. Then she spilled out all the water and she went away. The short green man said, The footman is a long time coming. Ear man, put your ear to the ground and tell me what's happening. I can hear the hag coming, said the ear man, but the footman, he's fast asleep, I can hear him snoring. So the short green man asked the eye man if he could see where the footman was, and the eye man said, He's lying asleep at the side of the road, and it looks like there's a spell of slumber over him. Oh. Put your gun to your eye and shoot. 
So the Iron Man put his gun to his eye. He took a little spot over the footman's head and shot. The crack of the pistol, the sound of the bullet woke the footman up. The footman ran as far back to the well in the Western world, filled his bottles again, and sped off to catch up with the hag. The Iron Man said back at the castle, The hag is coming! The hag is coming! And the short green man said to the blowman, Try and stop her! And the blowman blew out from his right nostril, then his left, and then both together, and it buffeted the hag, but she kept coming. He blew and blew and swayed the hag, but she kept coming. And at last, he blew her off her feet, and she went sailing into the air, back to the well of the western world. The footman came coming, three bottles of water, and the son of the king of Ireland had won the race. The lady let out another shriek of anger, and she said, I will never marry you until you have walked three miles without shoes or stockings on a sharp steel of needles. And then she had a sharp set of needles set out three miles long. The short green man said to the Thai man, uh, Excuse me there now. Do you know the way you've got thick thighs? Would you mind blunting those needles there? You know, just jump up and down on them a little bit. So the Thai man went along the road, jumping up and down on the needles. He went as far as he could. He reduced them to powder. And the king of Ireland's son walked along the road easy and free, like a fine young lad on a country stroll. So he had won his wife, with hair as black as a raven, skin as white as snow, and cheeks as red as blood. They were married then, and the green short man said, Don't forget, I am to have the first kiss. After me, said the king of Ireland's son. The short green man looked at him and said, Boyo, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. So, the short green man kissed the bride, and all the poisonous serpents of the king of poison had put into her, and his spells came out of her mouth. The king of Ireland's son then kissed her, so he would not be bitten by death. The short green man yet again had saved the king of Ireland's son. Now, you can go with your wife. I am a man who was in the coffin the day you paid my debt of ten pounds, boyo. Did you know that? I didn't, said the king of Ireland's son. Yes, my boy. I repaid my debts because you repaid them in my death. So the short green man, the eye man, the ear man, the foot man, and the blow man, and thigh man all went away. The son of Ireland, the king of Ireland, never saw them again. He brought his wife home with her hair as black as raven, her skin as white as snow, and her cheeks as red as blood. And they spent a happy life together. The end. So, that was story one. Boyo is such a cool word. Do you think so? You mean the leprechaun hat in the background? Yeah. It's, um, this is from Celtic Fairy Tales. I quite like this book. They give a lot more of the, um, not so well known Irish legends and mythologies. Very classic tales, would you say? Not just, um, Cúchulain or Fiona Cúl or like the Castle Raid of Cooley that are kind of known in the Western world and have been used many a time in film and, um, media. You're welcome, Soul Poetry. I hope you liked it. It was a different story. It was a long story. By God, trying to say the King of Ireland's son, like, ten times got me confused. Oh, well, thank you, Marnie. Thanks, Trap House Sync Edits. How is everyone else doing? I'm glad you liked it, Lisa. 
Lucifix. It was a it was an interesting story. It just shows you, you know, like how different fairy tales, like throughout the Western and Eastern world, can actually meld together. Like how many times have we heard stories about a fairest princess in the land with hair as black as like coal, skin as white as snow, and lips as red as blood. They always find their way into each other's stories. Panic at the Disco fan page. You didn't have a panic attack, did you? Oh, I get it. I get it. That's funny. Oh, Panic at the Disco are disbanding. Like, who else is kind of distraught by that? I'm so sad. Hey, Dreams Frog. Like the name. Hey, KG Cookies. I'm, I'm tired, um, Katrin, but you know what? I'm happy. And that's, that's all I try to be right now. If I can be happy, I'm doing okay. Would I ever go on a journey like that with um, a guy who's got thick thighs? Yeah. Yeah. I want to be the guy with thick thighs. That's what I want. I want to be that guy. Will we read another story, or do you want to keep chatting? It's very early Moncherry. It's like a five, half five. Brendan won the Oscar. Yeah, he, it was well deserved. Oh, crap. I hope I didn't ruin anything like saying Panic at the Disco was disbanding. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Oops. Sorry if I ruined it like someone who said, you know, Dumbledore dies in Harry Potter 6. I'll try and read a story that doesn't um, get me confused with the words as much, but I'm glad you liked it. You've been missed, Stuart. I have been taking time for myself, Stephanie. You know? You're a very nice young man. You found me on TikTok last month. Oh, thank you, Mon. Oh, it's, um, hey, it's Stuart. I don't know how you could tell. Not even like on camera, but thank you. Yeah, Aaron, I hope you liked the cameo, the monologue. To read about myths. The Mists of Avalon. Why does that sound familiar? That sounds really familiar. What song do I unwind to? I don't really unwind song. I listen to music like this. I like orchestral music. Let me read. I'm going to read one from this, okay? Ooh, so bright. Oh, thank you for the gift. That was lovely. Thank you for that. Give me a good one that we haven't done. Ah, uh, no, I have to. I really have to. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry if you've already heard this one like 1200 million times when it comes to me going live and reading Irish fairy tales. I just, I just, I just love it. I just love it. So, um, I'm going to read Ashin and Tiernan Oak. And if any of you are interested, just while it's in my head, Tiernan Oak was, um, a stage adapted musical this year, but because of, um, uh, the pandemic, let's just say it was cut short. But there is a stage um, original cast recording of the show that I recorded for them and their archives. And like just the music is beautiful. And it's it, ugh, the musical needs to get like picked up again and funded because it could go so international. It was like Disney. It was so mythical and it was it, ah, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I love the story. So Ushin is um, a warrior prince, and we're going to read about him. You can, sorry, the Tirnanog is on Spotify. I should have said that, I should have led with that. Go to Spotify and listen to it. 
Can we go? Well, we're, I'm actually going to read you two stories, one straight after the other, so we understand who Ashin is. Ashin is the daughter, is the son of Fionn McCool, who's one of Ireland's greatest warriors and leader of our, let's say our, what's a good reference? Our magic, magical army of Irish warriors and like fae called the Fianna. So that is what we're going to do next. One second. Yeah, I'd appreciate it if you shared the live. That would be great. Thank you. Double tap, press all those buttons. Just do whatever like you need to in this space. That helps. I'll keep reading until I fall asleep. I promise I won't fall asleep on the live again, but it's me. You can't trust me. I can't trust me. Ah, oh, thank you, Blue Water. If I knew French, I would. Oh, okay. Ace, thank you. I'm glad you like my videos. I started Twitch so that I could, um, you know, like, do this on Twitch. Apparently, it was, like, a lot better than um, other apps. But, yeah, I think it's, like, cool. It's a vibe. I like being on both, and I like playing games now again, which is actually really bad. It consumes me. Sorry. That gaming life, yo. I'm terrible. Okay, so. A little bit of backstory. The birth of Ushin. Fionn McCool had two favorite hunting dogs called Bran and Scalon. He trusted them as if they were family, and in a way they were. You see, the dog's mother had once been human. Fionn's aunt, in fact. While pregnant, she had been turned into a dog by a witch, and later gave birth to her twins in the shape of dogs. Now Fionn named them Bran and Scalon, and their strange heritage made them more than ordinary dogs. One thing you need to understand about Irish mythology is that there is a lot of um, shape-shifting. Uh, people being turned to animals, animals being turned to people, and a lot of skullduggery in that sense. One day, Fionn McCool was out hunting with the Fianna and his two togs, Bran and Scalon. They roamed the plains of Kildare all day and had no luck catching anything. And they were heading back to Fionn's fort in the hill of Almu when they were almost struck by a curious sight. The most beautiful of deer sprung out from the ferns right in their path and locked eyes with Fionn. The hinds Dark eyes looked straight into Fionn's soul with long lashes, pleading, wanting to be chased. They took a step back. Fionn on his horse with his two dogs took a step forward. The deer looked once more at Fionn and then took off, bounding it back into the forest. Over rotten logs and crashing through the undergrowth, then Fionn followed with his dogs. Sounding his horn so the rest of the Fiona could follow. His horse struggled to keep up with Brandon Scalon, who had gone ahead, chasing the deer, straight towards the hill of Alnu. And Don thought this was strange. Why would a wild animal go to a human dwelling? He'd expected the deer to head deeper into the forest. But the deer, the dogs, and Fionn were moving so fast that they left everyone else behind. Bursting through the alder trees at the edge of the forest, Fionn and his horse emerged atop a green grassland surrounding the hill of Almu, and Fionn was flabbergasted at what he saw. The deer lay on the grass, panting from exertion from its sprint, and on the other side of it lay Bran and Scalon, licking its face and trembling limbs as if the deer was a brother or sister. Fionn pulled his horse up short of this extraordinary scene, knowing that there was something much more special to this deer than he knew. When the rest of the Fiona caught up, 
Bran and Scalon stood protectively over the deer, teeth bared so none of the other hunting dogs would attack. Fionn wheeled around on his horse and ordered his men to call off their dogs. It was as if this deer was trying to find refuge, explained Fionn, nodding towards his white-walled fortress on the hill. And no guest of mine, even a deer, will be harmed on my property. Is that understood? And with that the day's hunting was called off and Fionn led the party up the hill for a much-needed rest and the deer followed. Bran and Scalon never left her side. Now she even lay with the dogs at Fionn's feet at supper, and Fionn woke up in the middle of the night to the sounding of an open door, and there light flooded from the torches outside, and standing in the middle of his chamber door was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. She had pale skin, hair so blonde it was almost white. Her eyes were unusually dark with long lashes. But when Fionn saw his ears, they were slightly pointed. She was not human. She was a member of the Tuhade Dawan, the fairy folk. I must be dreaming, said Fionn, rubbing his eyes. This is no dream, Fionn McCool, said the woman. My name is Saif, and I am the deer that you chased in the forest yesterday. Speechless, Fionn sat up on his bed. The dark druid of my own tribe wanted to marry me, continued Saif, and when I refused he placed an enchantment, turning me into a deer. One of the druid's servants took pity on me and told me the spell could be broken if I slept in the fort of Fionn McCool. Bran and Scalon must have known of this, said Fionn. They sensed, as most magical creatures do, that I was under an enchantment. Well, my home is your home, said Fionn. For as long as you decide to stay, um, you have my protection. And Saev did stay and she made herself useful, helping out wherever she could, and as the days went by, Fionn fell more and more in love with her. Though well aware of the dangers of guessing with the fairy folk, Fionn proposed to Saive, and they were married. And Fionn was so much in love with her, he neglected his duties as captain of the Fiona, and even stopped hunting. His men were worried he was getting soft. One day, however, a call came to the door that he could not ignore. Warships are approaching the northern sea, said the king's messenger. Please, don't go, begged Saif to her husband. I must, said Fionn. I am captain of the Fiona, and our duty is to protect Ireland. I will leave men to guard you, my love, but I must go. You will be safe so long as you stay within these walls. And with that, Fionn hopped on his horse, rounding up the Fiona from all five provinces of Ireland, and drove to Dublin Bay. There they fought the invaders for seven days, finally driving them back to sea. Those that didn't escape had their ships burned and a warning to their fleeing comrades never to return. Battle-weary, Fionn rode up the hill to Almu, expecting to see his beautiful wife looking out over his walls. She was not there. When he saw the downcast face of his guards, he knew something had happened. What? Where is my wife? Where is my wife? Three days after you left, sir, we saw a figure who looked exactly like you returning up the hill with Bran and Scalon, and the Lady Saif was so excited to tell you um, some sort of news that she pushed open the gates and rushed to meet you. But, um... I'm sorry, Fionn. The second she left the gates, the man threw off a disguise and revealed to be a druid under dark robes and with this hazel wand, he turned your wife into a deer and led her into the enchanted forest. We grabbed our weapons and we rushed, but there was no trace of the deer. The, he could not be found, sir. By now the color had drained from Fionn's face. He didn't speak. 
He just walked away and shut himself into his room, refusing company, refusing drink, refusing food. On the third day, he emerged to take up his duties as captain of the Fina. But in every spare moment, he searched for Sive. For seven years, he scoured the four corners of Ireland with Bran and Scalon, but to no avail. He'd all but given up on finding his wife again when one day he was hunting with the Fianna and he heard the dogs make a terrible racket ahead. He parted the foliage to find surrounding a naked boy who looked about seven. Bran and Scalon had stood protectively over the boy like they did the deer to stop all the other hunting dogs from causing harm. Fionn had witnessed this exact same scene, and he was reminded. He spoke up to the child. What is your name, boy? And the boy with fair hair, so blonde it was almost white, turned to Fionn with eyes like dark pools, with long lashes. And when he tried to speak, all that he could make were grunting noises and neighs like that of a horse or a deer. It wasn't easy for the boy to adapt, but Fionn took him back to the hill fort of Almu. Fionn gave him a bed, gave him lessons, gave him clothes, but then the boy would rip them off, and when meals were placed in front of him, he took them under the table and ate with the dogs. Bit by bit, however, the boy did adapt to the new habits of life. He listened to Fionn's conversations, picking up new words every day trying to use them with his own mouth, tasting them as if, as if like exotic fruits. After every year, year after year, he was almost like any other boy in Almu, except for his eyes, which were dark with sadness that Fionn never asked about. He waited for the boy to offer it up willingly, and one day he did. Sitting between Bran and Scalon, by a roaring fire, the boy told Fionn his story. His earliest memories were being cared for by a deer. She gave him milk when he was thirsty and kept him warm on winter nights. They lived on fruit and berries, and the boy wasn't aware that the deer was different from him in any way. One day they were visited by a man in dark robes carrying a hazel wand. Usually... They steered clear of humans, but the boy's mother seemed to know this man, though she was wary of him, because she stood protectively in front of her son, and the man spoke to her in a strange language. But the boy's mother understood, shook her head, and the man went away in anger. Many times the stranger returned, offering the same noise in strange language. She would shake her head and turn back to her son. But one day the man became so angry he waved his wand at the deer, pushing her into a trance and leading her through the trees. When the boy tried to follow, his mother shook his head, telling him to stay put. She said, one day someone will come and rescue you. For days he wasted. She didn't return. When she didn't, he went searching. He searched and searched until he couldn't search no more. And he began to cry, and that is when he was found by the Fianna, Bran, Scalon, and Fionn. Fionn listened to this story with joy, knowing that this boy's mother was his wife's Saiv. Tears and sadness flowed with joy down his cheeks. He looked at the boy, the boy looked at him, and although Fionn had lost his wife, he had gained the son he never knew existed. He called him Ashin, which in Irish means little fawn. He grew up to be one of the Fianna's greatest champions, renowned also for his poetry, his singing, and his storytelling. He became a leader of men. They respected him, but kept him at arm's length too. There was another otherworldliness about Ashin. It frightened normal people. Perhaps it was his dark pool eyes, his slightly pointed ears, or probably because he had the blood of the fairy kind in his veins. 
Oshin would go on to have many an adventure with the Fianna. But his greatest adventure of all was that of his journey to Tiernan Oak. And that is the story of Ushin and how he became Fionn's son. You love the name Ushin. Oh, thank you, Shawnee, for that. I hope this makes your day. Here is my smile for the day. That's a lovely message. Thank you. I appreciate that. It, I wouldn't say, like, it's beautiful at all, Louise, because he, he does go in the end. Probably have a very different book to yours, Megan. Like, you have to realize, like, these stories are well over, like, centuries old. So there's deviations compared to every publication. I never liked the idea of, you know, one, like, fairy tale or myth having to be rooted in one kind of thing. You stumble upon me randomly. Oh, thank you, Sarah. I hope it's okay. I'm glad you like it. You like the reading, Tara? Well, I'm happy. I'm humbled you like the reading, and you like me to read. The Sassy Napkin, thank you very much for the five gifts. Thank you so much for that. I haven't a clue how to do the subscription on Twitch yet, no. I'm still trying to figure all that out. A um, lot of stuff happened over the last couple of weeks, so... Had to take a break, you know? Just switch off, not do anything. I'm glad my voice is soothing. I'll read you one more story if you'd like that. This is the book I have. Megan, Irish Fairy Tales and Myths by Kieran Fanning. I'm glad you like this. Brandy, thank you. What time is it for everyone? Like, I'm going on 6 a.m. What time is it for ye lovely people? Lotus Winter, I think you're pushing it with two. Ray, it's only 1 a.m. Okay. 11.48, I say I love you, want to go to bed. Almost 2 a.m. moonlit. Okay. 12 a.m. Coco. You're from Texas, which, okay. Don't know what that means in terms of time, but I'll take it. Alex B, where are you from if it's only 5 p.m.? Is it 5 p.m. on Monday, Sunday, or Tuesday? Smiley XD. If I would to give a name to a rabbit, um, Conan. Cunin. Cunin, as in the Irish word for rabbit. Or Fanon. I always like the name Fanon. I always wanted to call my son Fanon. Or Fiacra. Imagine calling, like, my, my pet rabbit Fanon and then calling my child Fanon after that. Australian and Monday, okay. The glowing orb behind me is, um... It was one of those touchscreen LED moons. So it was one of those color-changing moons, but what unfortunately happened to it is that it got dropped. So I took a bunch of little LED fairy lights and stuck it in.
You like that one. I'm glad, Rennie. You're named about my rabbit. So I'm going to write in the YouTube chat. That would be my name to call a rabbit. Fionn. Sam, inbox me. Psychic visions by Tiffany. Oh, sorry. Wrong message. Yeah. I'll read one more. I will. Defoy, I hope you liked it. Thank you. The dog's name was Indiana. That's a nice name for a dog. Okay, one more story, and then I'm going to go to bed for a few hours before I've got to hit up on a bus and go to a few meetings, and then go to the concert. Uh. So, Tear Nanog. I do quite like this story a lot. I really wanted to actually just read this for the week. Under the Hawthorn Tree. So this is a story about the Great Irish Famine. And it's a, it's a, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say mandatory in most schools, but every school makes you read it. It's the Children of the Famine series, based all around um, these three siblings and what they did to survive the famine, how one emigrated to America, one stayed in Ireland, and one um, had a family. But anyway, sure. Shall we begin the final story? Thank you for the roses, Nev Thrill. I hope I said that right. Neve Thrill. Sounds like something from Lord of the Rings. Ashin in Tirnanog. Many countries have a legend about a hero going to another world, only to return hundreds of years later. In Britain, it's the story of King Herla. And in Ireland, it's the story of Ushin and Tiernan Oak, the land of youth. Tiernan Oak would be the equivalent to Peter Pan's Neverland. Fionn McCool and the Fianna were out hunting among the lakes of Killarney one day. The sun sparkled off the water and it warmed the men's bones. And they stopped to watch a rider from a distant hill. And as it got closer, they were surprised to see that it was a beautiful woman with long golden hair tied into plaits. Her eyes were so blue, they reflected the sunlight like big pools of water, making them sparkle. She wore a cloak embroidered with yellow stars and rode a magnificent white horse, saddled and shod in silver. I am looking for Fionn McCool, captain of the Fianna, said the woman. Oh, well, look no further, said Fionn, for I am the man you seek. And who, pray tell, might you be? I am Neave, of the golden hair and the daughter of the king of Tirnanog. How may I be of service to you, Princess Neov of the Golden Hair? Said Fionn, brushing his hair back off his forehead. Actually, um, it's your son, Ashin, I'm looking for. Oh, said Fionn, slightly disappointed. How do you know my son? I don't, said Neov. But I have heard of his bravery and his kindness and his skills in arts of music. Poetry and storytelling. Ashin, who had been listening to this conversation with the rest of the Fianna, couldn't believe what he was hearing. The most beautiful woman he had ever seen was asking for him. Fionn, always protective of his son, and not anyway jealous, asked, And, um, what business might you have with Ashin? 
My father, the king, wants me to find a husband. And are there no eligible men in uh, Tirnanog? Oh, there are plenty, said Neov. But since I have heard the stories of Ushin, I can't stop thinking of him. I have come to see him for myself. Ushin couldn't hold his tongue any longer. He brought his horse out of the clearing and said, I'm Ushin. Neov blinked her eyes. You are indeed, yes, as handsome as the stories say. What say you? Would you be my husband? If you come with me, you will one day rule Tirnanog, the land where nobody grows old and nobody dies. You will have food aplenty, towering castles, uh, hundreds of swords, uh, hundreds of cattle, hundreds of sheep, uh, hunting dogs, loyal servants, a uh, hundred brave warriors. Ushin couldn't refuse such an offer, but all he could see was Neov. She needn't have said any of this. He was blindly in love with her. But he would have to leave his family, his friends, and his home behind. There is one thing I want, he replied. And she is sitting on the horse in front of me. And with that, he had made his decision. He moved towards her, but Fionn put out his hand to stop. Ashin. My precious son, please don't go. If you do, I fear I will never see you again. Father, I can tell already this woman is who I was meant to marry. If I do not go, my heart is going to crack down the middle, said Ashin, his eyes bright with love. And Fionn nodded, for he understood true love. He had felt it the same for Ashin's mother, Saiv. Fionn was also aware that his son was part she, part of the fairy folk. And a mortal wife could never satisfy him in the way this eternal princess could. Promise me you'll return, he begged his son. I could not bear the thought of never seeing you again. I promise, said Ashin. But his mind was already on his beautiful bride-to-be, and he took Neve's hand and climbed atop her horse. And without a backwards glance... They left. They galloped across the hill, the woodland, until they reached the shores of the ocean. Their horse never broke stride, though, and when it reached the sea, it continued to light-footed gallop over the waves, its hooves barely touching the water. With Neve's perfuming hair blowing in his face, Ashin watched Ireland shrink away in the distance until they were surrounded by sea. After a while... Land appeared in the horizon, growing larger with every splash of the horse's hooves. A rich green island appeared before them with sandy beaches that was overlooked by an ivory castle. Crowds lined the strand, cheering and waving flags at the approaching riders. The horse slowed to come to a halt on the sand, and Ashin, saddle sore and weary, dismounted and helped Neve down from the horse. The people seemed overjoyed to see their princess. They fell silent when a man, who could only be Neve's father, the king, part of the crowd. He wore a red cloak with sparkling gold crown. He hugged his daughter and bowed to Ashin. Welcome to Tirnanog, my prince. Ashin returned the bow. He had never been called a prince before. Only a few days later, Neve and Ashin were married. The banquet lasted seven days and nights. They had the finest food, wine, and music. The guests danced and fell asleep, woke up and danced and fell asleep, and woke up and danced and fell asleep, and the party continued on and on. The people of Tirnanog were all so young and healthy. Nobody got old, nobody got sick, and nobody died. There was no war, murder, or crime of any sort. It truly was a paradise in every way. As the years went on by, Neev and Ashin continued to be happy as the day they were married. But Ashin had began to grow a bit homesick. He missed his father and the Fiona and their hunting expeditions. He asked Neev if he could return home for a visit. Her heart ached to see her husband upset. But she knew if he returned to Ireland, he might never return back to her. She loved him too much to lose him. So instead, she distracted him with kisses and gifts and plans of their future. She encouraged him to put all those memories of Ireland out of his head. 
The more he tried, however, the stronger they became and grew, and his whole demure became racked with loneliness. He became a shadow of the man he once was, the man that Neve had married, and she knew she had to do something about it. Even if you did go back, she said, it wouldn't be the same Arland. It would have changed. I don't care, said Ushin, brightening at the idea of returning. I just want to see the place again. You may take my horse and go, she said, under one condition, Ashin. He nodded. You must promise not to leave your saddle once you get there. I promise. I mean it, Ashin. You mustn't touch your feet on Arlish soil. She knew this was important because her own father had asked her to do the same thing. When she had gone to Ireland for the first time, she knew something bad would happen. And she knew something bad would happen if Ushin got off his horse. He laughed and told her not to worry. Then he kissed her, ran to the stables, saddled up Neve's white horse, and was gone. She watched Ushin gallop across the waves, and Neve then felt an emotion that she had never experienced before. Anxiety. Deep in her heart, she knew her dungeon, her husband was on a dangerous quest, but there was nothing she could do. The horse's hooves caressed the water so gently they barely made a splash, and soon the emerald shores of Ireland appeared ahead. Ashin couldn't wait to see his father, all his friends, and the Fianna, so he galloped up the beach across the hills to search for them. He couldn't believe how much the place had changed since he'd left. It'd only been seven years. Many of the forests had been cleared, made into farmland with little enclosures full of little sheep and little cattle. Strange stone crosses and were on buildings with narrow windows and spires and bells all dotted the landscape. Ushin had no idea what they were for. He was equally shocked when he met some people. They were so small now and weak-looking Nothing like the Celtic people he remembered living with. When he asked about the Fionn and the Fianna, they cowered and shook their heads. To them, Ushin looked like a god, all muscle and golden locks. Frustrated, he decided to head to the hill of Almu, where Fionn lived. But instead of the white-walled citadel, he found a crumbling ruin, overgrown with ragwort and nettles. Where is everybody? wondered Ushin. And what has happened to this place? He decided to write to Tara, because if anybody knew where the Fina would be, the hiking of Ireland could tell him. On his way, he passed through the Valley of Thrushes, not far from where Dublin stands today, and he came upon a group of men trying to move a boulder from a field they were plowing. There must have been ten men in total, but they couldn't manage to shift the rock, even the tiniest bit and their mouths dropped open when they saw Ushin approach. One of the men made a series of strange movements with his right hand, touching his forehead, then his chest, then his shoulders. Do you want some help? asked Ushin, pointing to the boulder. The men nodded fearfully, but Ushin, remembering Neve's warning, didn't leave his saddle. The rock was so small anyway, he knew he'd be able to lift it with one hand while staying on the horse. He leaned down, and with one hand, he scooped up the rock from the earth and flung it over into a nearby ditch. The villagers were transfixed by this feat of strength and their eyes followed the arch of the rock through the air. They didn't see the girth of Ushin's saddle snap. They didn't see the son of Fionn McCool fall to the ground, touching the soil of Ireland, just as Neve had warned him not to do. Upon touching the ground, Ushin's body curled up into a ball. His bones began to shrink, leaving his skin loose and wrinkly. His teeth and hair and muscles all disappeared in an instant. By the time the villagers had returned their focus to Ushin, he was a frail old man. I knew he was a fairy, said one of the men. One of the braver men knelt down beside Ushin. Who are you? 
I am Ashin, son of Fionn McCool. You can't be Ashin. Fionn McCool and the Fina died over 300 years ago. Ashin was speechless. It had only been the time he'd left. The time he'd been in Tirna It had been a short time. Seven years. How would it been 300 years in Ireland? Neve did not warn him. The time changed differently. She only warned him something terrible would happen and that Ireland was not the same place. Perhaps she feared what he would think. This old man is dying, yelled one of the villagers. Someone, please, get the priest! Together, they carried Oshin to the priest. The priest's name was Patrick, who told him the story of the new religion that had come to Ireland. Ashin learned that these stone buildings were called churches, and they were there for Christianity. Before he died, Ashin in turn told Patrick the story of Fionn McCool and the Fianna. His beloved Neave with the golden hair in Tirnanog. Patrick wrote this all down with quill and ink. And this is why we have these stories today. The end. See, this is the thing. It could be creative license that the priest... I know a story where it's actually um, just a normal uh, father, cleric, bishop that, you know, gives Ushin his last rites. They named the priest Patrick, so is that some kind of you know, reference to St. Patty. Who here in the chat knows anything about St. Patrick? Who here knows the real story of St. Patrick, should I say? He, was the pa he is the patron saint of Ireland, Brockwell, yes. He didn't drive saints from Ireland, he drove snakes. But there is no snakes in Ireland. Ireland is actually so far away from the rest of the, um, the Eastern world, all of Europe, that snakes could never get there. Um, we do have a few reptiles, but we have one kind of grass snake only found in the Burren, which is a massive slab of limestone that's like 60 kilometers long. What the snakes were, was paganism and druids, the people who um, prayed to the gods, to religion, to the fey folk, sorry, not religion, to the fairies. He drove all that away from Ireland. Because, and this is the funny thing, and I think this is so, such a cliche. He was ordered to. Not because he had divine intervention from God, like it says in some of the books. It's because um, his father was a Roman, a Roman general. So Patrick was told by his father, you know the language, go over there, convert them to Christianity for us. Patrick was born in Wales. He's not even Irish. He's Welsh. His father was a Roman general, but Patrick did get kidnapped as a child to buy Irish invaders to go over and herd sheep and pigs. So while, I, while Patrick was a child in Ireland, what he had to do was basically learn the language bit by bit so that he could, you know, work for his masters of the house. He could interact with people. He then escaped as a teenager, got back to Wales, and it was basically a case of him getting back to Wales and going to his dad, Daddy, I'm still alive. I didn't die. I was just kidnapped. Can I have a hug? And his dad going, mm, You know the language. Do you know what? Take a small army, go to Wales, Scotland, and back to Ireland and convert them all to the good grace of God, would ya? That's why Patrick came back to Ireland. Not because God told him to come back and, you know, heal his mortal sins for Christianity. It's just interesting. 
you're melting at my voice. That's either a really good or a bad thing, Sandy. Do you know what? If you look at a lot of the saints or patron saints, you know a lot of them can be very insidious. But St. Patrick's Day is our national holiday for Christian reasons. The first massive parade was in New York sometime in the early 90s? 19... I'm not even sure. I'd have to look that up. Major daddy issues, Francis Rose. I think that's the best line. St. Patrick had major daddy issues. I'm glad my voice is um, soothing. YouTube channel, ASMR, everyone. Uh, well, we're on YouTube right now. So, yeah, hop over there. I don't know if I'd be good at ASMR. We've given a couple of my voiceover reels to different places. I'm just waiting for someone to bite. Well, I'm glad it helps Garden Gotcha. Thank you for that. That made my that made my night. I'm glad it's very soothing, Caroline Ash. Thank you for sharing. You almost fell asleep. Well, I will tell you now, I am going to fall asleep on a live, and I don't think anyone wants that. I am reading from Irish Fairy Tales, Myths and Legends. That is by Kieran Fanning. And then Celtic Fairy Tales by Neil Phillip. I hope you like... Thank you for the roses, Morgan. You sent me an RM. Oh, thank you, Year 8. Was that a DM? Thanking you for the help you've given me. Oh, thank you, Isabel. Those messages um, are really nice. I'm glad, like, my gaff, my wacky, goofy, cringy videos help. The reading helps you calm. Anyway, guys, I am going... <laughs> good morning, Sonja. And I'm going to say good night, even though it is morning. Have an amazing time at the concert if I don't fall asleep at the concert now. Could you imagine? Bellion, you sent a cameo. Yeah, thank you. My favorite Akhtar character is Tamlin, and he will always be. I love you, Freya. Thorns and all. Queen Jazla. Jalava. Queen Jalava. Thank you. I will have a good night. I don't know why messages were deleted by a moderator. There is no moderator in the Twitch stream, so I will try and fix that. Tamlin is the best character, and you can all fight me on that. I hope you all enjoyed the stories. Anyway, guys, I will figure out when is the next time I'm able to go live. I'll let you know probably on Instagram. So if you don't follow me there, go follow me there. Yeah. So I'm going to say good night to everyone on YouTube first. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night. Have a good day and the day you deserve. Have a good one, guys. Bye.